Welcome back to the Chester Beatty, a place where the stories of faith come alive. In this film, yeah. we delve into the theme of living and thinking, exploring how the diverse threads of faith weave together to form the rich tapestry of our lives. How does the way we live our faith shape our understanding of the world? Living our faith is a continuous practice that guides our actions and decisions and interactions. It's about embodying the values and teachings of our sacred texts and part. Through our daily lives, we carry forward the tradition and rituals that have been passed down to us. Living our faith means being mindful of the responsibilities towards ourselves, others and the world. Our faith offers us a lens through which we look at the world, enabling us to find meaning and purpose in everything we do. It shapes our perspectives, values, and the way we engage with others. Let's now introduce these three objects from the Chester Beatty Collection that depict aspects of living and thinking within different faith traditions. It's one of the objects of the Chester Beatty Library because they have a lot of different objects, especially with the Islamic background. In Islam, we don't have a picture of God we have the attribute 99's names of God, which describe to you uh, who is God. It's explained in this object with the balance in the two trees at the two sides of the object. And then in the middle of objects, is the, it's described the prophets, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad. It's very nicely done, which is done in the 18th century uh, from Turkey. That was quite a, a fascinating experience, you know, looking through all the objects of various religions. And as a child growing up in Nigeria, where I came from originally, there are quite a lot of um, mixed families of Christians and Islamic. So I was always been intrigued by Islamic calligraphy. Seeing this and why it was done, sort of drew my attention. I was, it, was, it was an aha moment for me also that there was a lot of emphasis on uh, writing and describing rather than pictures and images in Islam. I begin to see things that I'm familiar with that are being represented there as well. You know, we have in the Garden of Eden, for example, the Tree of Life. You see a description of, of a prophet because in, in the Old Testament text of the Bible, you have uh, quite a graphic prophetic description of, of Jesus himself and his suffering and everything it was quite graphic and that caught my attention. And I suppose the first thing that's striking is such detail, you know, to captivate, you know, the dying ritual from the person dying in the bed to their being laid out, to their being interred in the ground and to the, just the color and decor and intensity to which it has been um, depicted. It really struck me, you know, you have the role of the celebrant, you know, in the first part of it and the, the community of people gathered around to the second page where you just see two women down at the bottom of the page, which for me is really important. That at least it shows something that women were involved in, in some of this ritual. And then, you know, the way that we're moving along and, the, you know, the changing of the robes on the people when they went to carrying, you know, the, the remains of the person and then you see where they were in black then, and then where the, obviously people in white began to enter the body, and then the people coming back. Um, and I suppose for anybody, it's the captivating thing of what happens when we die. And in all traditions, there's a ritual around dying. Well, I think it causes people to stop to wonder why people wanted to record this in such great detail. You know, the text is not the important piece, it's the images that transmit the story. You know, when you look at both the colour, the artwork, the detail of the people gathered around the person who was dying, obviously the, these people were of a certain class, because why was it so important to record the death of this person in such detail? So I think it records life in picture as opposed to life in text. And for very often it's images that call us, it's the images that welcome us into a narrative very often rather than a text. A mandala is an interesting picture of the universe. It's a picture of reality, really, in many ways. So some of the objects in the, in the collection may, have, may be structured in a narrative way. 
for example, the Office of the Dead. Uh, you know, we see a narrative taking place, or even in some of the depictions of the life of the Buddha. But then you have this more abstract, static, eternal image. You know, it has a spiritual nature of the absolute, it's a depiction of absolute reality. When we look at this mandala, we see things we see in many mandalas. We see um, the four guardians of, of universal space, you know, which is a recurring theme in religious traditions. We see uh, the unity of a circular image, which uh, has no beginning and no end. So in this mandala, we see uh, it's almost like getting a snowflake and putting it under a microscope and looking, and you see this great richness of depth opening up. And the closer you look, the more detail you get. And any part of the mandala, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. It's almost like uh, looking at uh, subatomic particles or uh, elementary particles. So, this, so it, here's the universe being depicted on a macro and micro level at the same time in this depiction, I think, you know. One of the themes of analysis that was used in this process was thinking, and it did strike me that, you know, it, particularly from a Buddhist point of view, we constantly appreciate the limitations of thinking. So what about not, not thinking? Because thinking is a useful tool in the way that a hammer is a useful tool to hammer a nail in, but it's not very useful to cut a piece of thread, right? So thinking, uh, uh, you know, rational analysis of, uh, of texts is one approach, but we also need to bring other approaches to these objects in the collection, I would argue. And what I learned from talking to uh, Muslim, Jewish and Christians in this process was th the various mystical schools, for example, Sufi or, or Jewish, Jewish mysticism or Christian mysticism. And this appreciation is there also of the limitation of text and the beginning of silence. As we've witnessed through the objects from the Chester Beatty collection, living our faith is a continuous journey of growth, compassion and understanding. It is through this lens that we can appreciate the diverse threads that contribute to the vibrant tapestry of our society. Together, we can continue to foster a deeper understanding of diverse faith groups and build bridges of dialogue and respect. This film is part of a series called Fates in Focus, developed in partnership with the Chester Beatty and Dublin City Interfaith Forum. Why not check our other films? And if you like the content, please share and give this video a thumbs up. You can find more information and links in the video description.